and um, introduce myself. My name is Martha Burtis. I work here in the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State University, where I'm a um, learning and teaching developer. Um, and I am joined today with by my colleague, um, Matt Cheney. Hello. <laughs> is that a handoff? Thing? That's your okay. handoff, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Cheney. I'm Director of Interdisciplinary Studies here at Plymouth State University. Uh, and interdisciplinary studies is a program that allows students to create their own majors, and so it lives within the co-lab here at Plymouth. Uh, and I have worked, this is my fourth year as director of IDS, um, but I have also worked here as a uh, teaching lecturer or adjunct in more common uh, terminology, and uh, I've also been a contract faculty member here. Um, and we discussed doing this session um, oh, towards the end of the summer, Matt and I both um, were really interested in this topic and um, wanted to bring it to a larger group. And I wanna preface all of this by saying what we have planned today really is an open-ended conversation. We don't have a lot of formal you know, um, activities or, or presentation involved. Um, we basically just have some questions that we wanna work through together with all of you. Some of those um, we pre I previewed a little bit last week on Twitter. I know some people found this event by way of that Twitter thread. Um, and I'm gonna drop into the chat right now, a Google Doc um, link where we're gonna be um, trying to collect some answers to a few questions, particularly as we get started. And I'm gonna invite you all um, to go to the very first page of that, which asks just for maybe a sentence about why this topic interest, interested you or interests you and why you um, wanted to join this conversation today. One of the things that I've come to realize in thinking about this whole um, topic of the labor of teaching is that there's a lot of different um, lenses that people bring to the conversation and, concern, and um, sort of overarching concerns that people have. And I think it's helpful for us to know sort of that landscape, but also to um, that could help guide this conversation a little bit if we understand sort of where everybody's coming from um, and what's front of mind for you. So for me, I'll, as people are filling that out, I'll just say that, um, and I shared this on Twitter as well, the reason why this topic has become so uh, important to me as I work um, in the collab doing a fair amount of faculty development, we launched uh, or piloted a program this summer to sort of trouble um, that was looking at sort of troubling the idea of traditional instructional design. Um, and it, it became clear to me that it was impossible to have these conversations and do this kind of work without unpacking um, the, the question of labor and work um, and, and what it means for, um, for educators in higher education, what, that, what those words mean and what that work looks like. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that um, for myself, and I'll invite Matt to talk about what, what brought him um, to this conversation, and then we'll, we'll open it up to everybody. Yes, I've been interested in academic labor generally ever since my days as an adjunct, because I was one of those people who sort of joined, uh, after having been a high school teacher for 10 years, I, I joined the, the higher ed world with starry eyes. And... Uh, Thought, it, it thought all sorts of things that now I uh, have been disabused of thinking. Uh, and I remember vividly someone handing me Mark Bousquet's book, uh, mm -hmm. how, the, how the University Works. And it just kind of blew my mind and brought me into the, the world of, of labor theory uh, for academia. And uh, that was at a time when we as the adjuncts at Plymouth State were unionizing in a, in a rough unionizing battle, um, successful in the end. Uh, which I started out on the opposite side of. I was originally against it because I had this belief that academia is separate from the world of grubby work. Um, and uh, soon enough, though, joined in and ended up becoming president for first president of our union. So uh, learned a lot. And ever since then, um, as a grad student, as a contract faculty, and now as tenure track faculty, I've really tried to pay attention to what it is to work at an institution, particularly in the kind of times that we live in. So yeah, and as um, as Matt was introducing his own interest to this um, topic, I'm looking at what other people are sharing and I'm seeing some common threads, both echoing um, what Matt has shared, what I've shared and, and some other um, perspectives on this as well. One of the things I'll say about this Google doc, you'll notice on every page, there's a column there on the right 
um, that says other questions that come to mind. And I invite you at any time as we're having this conversation to pop in additional questions that, that may be provoked by our conversation. We just have a few here that we want to, that we've already pre-populated this document with to get us started. But we're definitely interest in, interested in having this conversation be emergent um, and responsive to your particular concerns and needs. So, um, so feel free to add anything over there as well. Um, before we get started um, into the first kind of formal question, would one or two people like to unmute and share um, anything that they put here for the pre-question that they particularly would love to hear us um, sort of talk about or around today? Uh, maybe in addition to things that Matt and I have already have already mentioned, if there's some other aspects or inflections to this that you are um, concerned with. And I know we don't all know each other, so it can be, yeah, go ahead, Liz, go for it. Um, I, uh, Tamara Knopper tweeted something last night that I retweeted and should find a way to copy and throw in the chat about the, the um, fracturing of research from teaching which I think is um, so, there's so much to talk about there. Like <laughs> when it comes to describing and doling out and compensating different kinds of work or labor. And so I guess I just, I'm thinking, I've been thinking about that a lot. I was so excited to read how she put it because I've been thinking about it for a really long time in particular with respect to our, our um, excellent uh, contract faculty. Um, who are compensated, whose job descriptions include compensation for teaching and service, but expressly not for scholarship. And I think that says volumes about a lot of things. And also, um, you know, uh, for greater context for folks here um, who, who aren't from Plymouth State, who are in this room, the contract faculty are full-time non-tenure track faculty at PSU um, that, as Liz said, do not have research as explicitly as part of their job description, but it is also the fastest growing, I believe, um, group of faculty that are being hired. So a lot of tenure track lines being replaced with those. So what does that mean for the institution at large, I would say, as that gets erased? Uh, Robin, yeah, you wanna add something? I was just gonna add that when our faculty tried to unionize the um, the time before this one. We were successful this time, but the time before this one, you know, I was super pro union and part of the organi you know organizing team that was trying to get the union to pass. But even so, we were trying to unionize. Now we unionize with AAUP, but at that time we were unionizing with um, SCIU. And I remember thinking, hmm we're academics, like we should probably unionize like through AAUP and like people who really understand like our academic issues. And, and, um, I, ha and I think I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't understand the commonalities around labor. You know, I really thought I had a sense of exceptionalism about the academy that I absolutely do not have anymore. I have like the actual opposite. I think not only are we nothing exceptional, but we're much more like some of the more problematic, like, you know, there's been all sorts of stuff the last couple of days about the Uberization of education and, uh, you know, about Amazon labor. And, you know, I, I look at those issues and I see so much of what we're struggling with in the academy. So my embarrassment and shame over not understanding those things just a few years ago, like it drives me now to be even more invested in thinking about labor critically. Thanks, Robin. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move us on to the first um, question that we have. Um, so uh, one more, there. I think you have a hand. It's just- Oh, I'm sorry, little... I missed it. It's faint from Carrie because it's not wildly yellow. <laughs> oh, I couldn't see it, Carrie. It was like almost it was hidden in the mountains. Yes, <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> yeah, I changed the color. You know, I like to do those sorts of things. So I am one of those contract employees. I'll just throw that out there. Um, we are non-tenured. We are clinical faculty. So I guess my thoughts are that I come from. 
I've come from a ver variety of milieus where we've been unionized. And so there are some, I wanna say some rigor around kind of what's expected. So here, I think it's a little bit more um, flexible. Is flexible a good word? Not sure. Uh, so sometimes, you know, in the middle of July, someone will contact me and technically I'm not on contract, right? So, but with an expectation that I'm going to do it. And so I feel, I guess, guilt. I guess that's my, um, you know, just a sharing piece here. I feel guilt because now they've had this student or potential student in this mix where I feel a duty to, you know, I think I was in the middle of uh, Utah trying to get on a mountain to connect with somebody. And the person was rather, the student was rather um, frantic about something, which again, it is what it is. So, you know, we're down employees. I think you folks know that a lot of the support staff, uh, we don't have as many folks around. And I felt a duty and my husband's like, you're standing on the top of our trailer trying to get cell coverage to help this person. I said, I'm not going to, I guess maybe I'm the person that has that knowledge. I need to help them, right? He's like, but you're not on contract. And I'm like, but it's the right human thing to do. And once the person talked to me and I gave them what I guess they needed, you know, and I said, I'm so sorry. I can see now I started, my phone started to explode, right? With all the emails and the text. I said, I am so sorry. I even put my out of office message. I put it in my voicemail. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there to you folks because it really creates for me, I guess, uh, ethical issue um, in some ways because I never want someone to feel like I'm not addressing them or, or helping them, right? Like, so it's, a, it's truly a labor of love, I think, in some ways, because I want them to feel supported, but I want to have boundaries. And what are, what, are, what are those boundaries? I guess as a nurse, maybe I have a little bit different of a take, like, you know, is this person okay? And I said, are you, how are you feeling now? I feel so much better, Professor. Thank you so much. And I said, I really apologize. She's like, I didn't know that you folks didn't work 12 months. And I'm like, oh, well, yes, that's why my out of office says that. So anyway, I just throw that into the foray. I don't know if anyone else out here is going to share that they're contractual, but anyway. Thanks, Carrie. That's such a great point. I was going to put this in the chat, but I'll just say it. That it's, it emphasizes one of those things that I think comes up again and again in conversations we have here in the collab, which is about those kind of hidden rules of higher education that very often we all live by and know, but our students don't necessarily, or some of our colleagues may not be aware of, and um, we don't talk about them explicitly um, and as other people have mentioned in this chat and, and as Matt was talking about yesterday and I think as you're echoing now so much of this is wrapped up too in what calls us to the profession in the first place and this sense that because this is a like a passion project right like because this is our our calling that somehow the boundaries of nine month 12 month full time tenure track are are erased in ways that can be super problematic. So yeah. um, when I was, I'll just jump in quickly please, Martha, yeah. on that because of one of the, the most radicalizing moments for me was a moment of despair as an adjunct when I realized that I had made myself easily exploitable. I had become someone who could be exploited by the, the institution to whatever degree that they wanted because I had so deeply bought into the idea of the calling. Um, and I had worked at places that, you know, I worked in boarding school for nine years, which is a deeply unhealthy work environment because it's 24 uh, seven living with your students and all. So I, I really had no sense of labor boundaries, of work boundaries, of life other than work. Uh, and I had then moved all of those feelings forward into work that paid me under $3,000 a course and no benefits. So I'm gonna um, ask us to move on to the first kind of formal question that's in here. And for this, this is the only um, a question that I'm gonna suggest we do this for is to take five minutes to just answer question one and or question one B um, quietly, individually. Um, what does your work um, slash labor of teaching look like? And then um, kind of related to that, what's the difference between work and labor? Um, and, and you'll notice for, a lot of these questions I've added comments with some additional thoughts or, or um, a great link, for example, that Liz shared yesterday about work versus labor um, that people may be interested in following up on. So feel free to just pop 
Any thoughts or ideas also again in that blue box, any additional questions that come to mind and then we'll come back in about five minutes and talk about what, what we see as common threads among what people are sharing and differences too. Oh, you need a Google Doc. Are you in the room? It looks like um, maybe the comments are slowing down um, a little bit. So I'm gonna suggest we jump back into the conversation and talk about um, any threads or commonalities that people are seeing um, in, the, in the answers to these two questions. Question one, what does your work slash labor of teaching look like? And question one B, what is the difference between work and labor? Um, I'm particular, I mean, I'm interested in both of these questions. Obviously, this difference between work and labor is something that I um, am like really just beginning to wrap my head around it. And as someone else said in here, um, so the question is stumping me and I love it. I feel similarly, and I often feel like I actually interpret these words the opposite of how others do, which I think is probably a failing on my part, but um, it's been very interesting to me to do some reading about this and also to see um, these different definitions reflected here in these answers. Any, um, but any, any threads or commonalities that people would like to call our attention to as they look over other people's responses? 
and feel free to unmute and, and speak if you would like to be called upon. You may also raise your hand. <laughs> but we're not formal here in the collab. I'm just noticing um, how many words are kind of related to <clears throat> like emotions and maybe this is like the English major in me kind of like going through and like picking out like repeated words or whatever but you know I see worry I see consoling I see emotional labor I see that this um, question caused some emotional reactions and um, I just can't help but think like some of the some of the issues around this question of labor is the invisible emotional labor that we all do that is so invisible that how do you even begin to um, compensate that and how do you protect yourself from the um, effects that emotional labor has on people. I, I recently read some stuff because I'm in a curriculum and instruction program about um, a grad program. And so I recently read an article about um, how K through 12 teachers are essentially leaving by the droves and this question of emotional labor, which not only requires you to help other people regulate their emotions, but also requires you to regulate self-regulate and hide your emotions so that you're actually seeming like you know things are fine you don't want to upset any students because you don't want that to have a, uh, an effect on them and um i just can't help but think like how much you know that takes out of us as educators i'll leave it at that yeah and as you actually as you're talking Hannah, it just really made me think of something that i'd love i'm thinking of carrie in particular i'd love to hear your thoughts on this coming from nursing because I was thinking about like other professions where care is part of the profession. It's um, it's built into the profession. And as a result, the professionalization of people in those careers, I think, speaks about care and acknowledges care and helps people who are going to become practitioners understand how they regulate that, how they manage their own personhood within those spaces of care and how increasingly I hear teaching be being using the same language, but us not talking about it as a career that requires that same sort of preparation for what it means to care for other people. So like counselors, obviously, if you're going into mental health, obviously you spend a lot of time thinking about how you regulate your own self in relationship to caring for others. I assume, Carrie, that is the case as well in healthcare professions, but we don't do that in teaching. It's just this additional um, sort of expectation that I feel like it's growing increasingly and we're not really acknowledging. I think that in attending the trauma workshop the other day was great. Um, I've, I've done um, trauma workshops, trauma-informed care, trauma-informed teaching and learning. So I, I think that part of that is, are the people that are, are doing the work too. So you know, part of those pieces, and that's what we're doing right now, right, is connecting and, and being healthy, but maybe starting from when someone is, is beginning their whatever role they have here, I'm talking everyone, maybe, maybe exploring that, that idea of how do we take care of ourselves? How do we ensure we are where we need to be emotionally, socially, spiritually, physically, um, setting boundaries, as I think we've kind of been talking around here, being able to therapeutically, again, therapeutically is a loose term, but to, to transparently communicate so that, you know, when we're talking to our students, having that, that thought of how you phrase, what you phrase, when you phrase it, which I'm sure you're all very good at, but from that trauma lens, right? So thinking, thinking about what we bring forward, but I do think that from those caring types of professions, we, we, thread, we thread all of these pieces through because we all come with, I guess, 
preconceived notions and and biases into our everyday life. So so there might be this this thought that well my professor doesn't care about me. My professor hasn't responded to me via email. They appear that they don't want to engage with me when behind the scenes, we probably have 80 different things going on, right? I mean, I know I do. I've actually closed my email because it just keeps dinging at me. So I'm not sure if I kind of hit the pieces, but Martha, I think that we need to emphasize our role. We need to emphasize what we bring as skilled communicators and empathetically, because I, I'm sure we're we're all, we all kind of have some commonalities here that we, we care about what we do and, and we care about our students. It's just sometimes probably setting boundaries. Some people are really great at setting boundaries and other people might need a little bit of support with that, but there's nothing wrong with having healthy boundaries for sure. And, to, but still showing that you care. I don't know, yeah. Martha, did I, did I kind of hit? No, no, that I think that's that's exactly exactly um, on point. And, and it just makes me, it just echoes for me the, whole, the thing we keep talking about again and again too in so many of these conversations, which is how little training, right, even exists for those of us who, who go into higher education. Like you, it's kind of catch as catch can. And so this idea that, you know, a lot of times our focus on training is focused on pedagogy or instructional design um, or tools or technology. And yet when we have this conversation about what is the work of teaching look like, as Hannah said, what people, nobody here talked about technology, I don't think, like what people are talking about. I mean, I mean, they may have like emails, but like mostly what people are talking about here is, as others have said, relational. It's about working with people. It's about the emotional labor. It's about how difficult that can be. Um, and, and yet that, that, how do we acknowledge that when we're doing so little preparation and training, even as it is, I don't know, it's just making me think about that. And I was thinking too, of, as you mentioned, uh, nursing and other care practices, as Hannah brought up, um, one of my best friends is a nurse and her husband is a community college teacher. We easily talk these days about mm -hmm. the limits of, of what's going on because she's facing at the hospital she works at huge uh, lots of half the staff on her floor has left mm -hmm. um, because because of covid things but also what's happening as we're seeing at universities the same time as covid stuff is happening there's all those financial things and pressures coming in that she just keeps saying this isn't the job i signed up for mm -hmm. i signed up to take care of people and instead uh, it, they're making it impossible for me to take care fascinating, of fascinating yeah <laughs> That's a really interesting, yeah, flip side. Anyone else have any other threads or thoughts um, that they pull from um, some of the responses in here that they'd like to bring forward? Yeah, Robin, go ahead. This is not a formulated thought, but I am thinking about how when I'm most frustrated at work, it's usually because I want to work more and I can't. <laughs> meaning not that I don't have time or whatever, but like the, the stuff that I consider to be my real work, I cannot do because I'm blocked by my work. <laughs> um, so I think that's just really interesting. It also makes me think of rigor a little bit when we talk in educational settings about people who want rigor, you know, we have to have rigor, rigor. And I'm just, you know, the idea of labor built into that is the idea of pain, I, I think. Like, it's just like almost part of the word, you know, like labor is almost the opposite of pleasure on some levels, just like grammatically. And I'm just interested in the fact that I think, and I was thinking about that with Matt's quote about, you know, somebody really wanting to do their job of caring for people and maybe even more than 40 hours a week, like maybe really get sustained by that work, like really wants to work hard at that. But what is the pain of labor, um, especially in higher ed that, you know, gets equated with what real labor actually is. And I, I think a lot of times, like when you're, negotiating with you un in unions, for example, the perception is like, we don't, we're working too much. We don't want to work that much. 
True, right? Like, yes, lots of us are working just, you know, but that's a seat time measurement that is maybe not the most valuable of the measurements, right? I don't know that it's about how long you work or how, you know, it's really about what is the work that we signed up and contracted with you to do and why can't we do that work? Uh, Jim, you wanna jump in? Yeah, um, what I've been thinking about is is listening to folks here, and I'm you know I, I forgot her name. Um, mentioned you know we're skilled communicators. We need to really, really um, work and be careful on that sometimes in these kinds of discussions. Um, and I'll tell you why because we, we we need to really think through what these terms mean to the people that are hearing them are hearing us talk about them and i'm not saying this if, and, you know well enough with the disclaimers um i'll give you some examples is when we talk i'm hearing like labor what i'm hearing from folks in this group and what i hear from other faculty and what i read about when i read from faculty and instructional designers and 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 academic staff is there's all this labor and what they are well i would phrase that as what they're really talking about is all of the energy and time and that has they have to put in as effort in other words how much of their life is devoted their living, not life, but their living, is devoted to producing stuff of value that's related to this institution. Now, you know, we talk about emotional labor. Um, the reason I'm, I, that's fine for us because we understand that's what's being meant by emotional labor, but we need to be very careful because we're in a capitalist structure even though these are nonprofit, you know, entities of the state, like a state university, sometimes, and sometimes they're private, they are structured in a capitalist hierarchical manner, colored by all of the imaginary of that. And when you say labor, even when, I mean, I, I just got through three years of sitting at the bargaining table uh, for the union um, <laughs> at my school, um 35 years ago i was uh, no 40 years ago i was at the table in bargaining for a corporation uh not an education so it's quite a quite a learning experience all of those folks in administration even the ones that are former faculty members who were formerly in our shoes and perhaps particularly them they are now over there in that other side with other responsibilities and other things happening to them. They have absorbed an imaginary. They're not even conscious of how they think about it. And for them, when they hear the word labor, they are hearing a cost element. Labor has a dollar sign attached to it. Labor, whatever it is, labor must be minimized. So getting rid of labor or distancing themselves from labor is a good thing, period. So when we say, oh, we have to, do, we have all this labor, they're like, no, nah, we don't want that. That's your problem. The other thing they do with labor is besides wanting to minimize it because it's a cost, is they want to, the name of the game in all of those structures for management is put the cost onto somebody else but get the value from the work anyway so you know they're going to sit there and go yeah so what you know because what they hear is when we talk about all these other forms of labor, what they're hearing is oh you know life's hard well yeah you know <laughs> um so i that's why i think we need to be careful about and and i'm I don't have magic words here. I'm actually, thank you for this conversation because it's rising it uh, to a level for me that I need to think this through in some writing, but it seems to me we need to be clear about what's effort, 
what's care, or you know what what what's value produced, what's labor. Um, yeah, I, I see Robin uh, working on it, working on it. First, I got to get the Thanks. sabbatical book done. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Autumn, I see your hand up. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm hearing from everybody that there's like the work that you love and then there's like the work that you either have to do or that you're being asked to do. Maybe you're refusing to do that work, <laughs> um, which there's been a lot of talk, especially in the ed tech space about the power of refusal and different ways that you can refuse, right? It doesn't have to be an all out like, hey, I refuse, right? There's lots of there's lots of ways that you can refuse. There's lots of ways that you can kind of bog things down, slow down the process when we're talking about harmful uh, technologies and processes and pedagogies and like those kind of things, right? But um, I'm noticing a uh, a move, and and I don't know, maybe I don't. I'm curious if other people see this too, where there's almost like a micro negotiation going on. Um, at the level of, you know, not from like in a, a higher up administration, but just like maybe within an office or within like an immediate um, boss employee kind of relationship where it's almost like doing that work that you love is now considered a type of compensation. Well, we're letting you do X, Y, and Z. <laughs> and that just seems profoundly inequitable to me. The work that you care about more than likely does benefit the university, right? You're not doing it just because you love it. Like you're doing it because it has this larger outfit, but it's um, it's almost now like another type of compensation that you're giving. And um, I think that's something that we need to think about. I'm wondering if other people experience this as well. And I'm wondering what are the ways that you can kind of push back from that and say, yes, okay, fine. You're letting me, you know, do the work I love, but that's not really doing me a favor. Like you're getting something from that as well, right? So I don't know. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. I don't know if other people are experiencing that as well, but I uh, would love to hear more about it. I'll just um, I'll just extend that with one thing that that reminded me of um, Autumn, which is that I sometimes say when we're in conversations about alternative assessment or ungrading that I feel for like a very long time grades was the penance that um, mm -hmm. teachers felt they had to pay in order to be able to pursue the life of the mind, like in order to be able to do their passion of teaching grades was the penance you had to pay and that there was a certain, and I often talk to faculty who it feels like there's a certain amount of guilt involved in saying, well, I'm going to move to alternative assessment practices because it feels like that's not doing the penance. And I'm wondering now, as I say that, whether or not some of the move to alternative assessment and more of the embracing of um, alternative assessment and ungrading is faculty having their eyes open and also the ground shift under them where suddenly they're realizing, wait a minute, what, what used to be a calling and a passion is now feeling more and more like I'm being asked to work beyond my means or labor beyond my means. And so where is a place where I'm already feel like I'm, I'm, um, I'm being damaged and my students are being damaged. And if that's grading, is there something I can do differently there? Um, and I do feel like assessment and grading very often figures into this. Although interestingly, I don't know if anybody put grading in as what does the work of teaching look like? which is, I think is very, very interesting. Go ahead, Liz. Um, I just, as you were talking about um, ungrading uh, and sort of different reasons and context for moving in that direction, I just think for me, it's like, it's more labor. <laughs> like grading is easy, <laughs> but it doesn't do anything. Um, so I just think what I've noticed is, is it's, it's like sort of what Robin was saying, like, it's more, <laughs> it's more, I want to do more. I want my students to do more and to us, for us to do that sort of together. So I just wanted to make that observation about sort of moving to more ungrady stuff. I always valued grading because it was a visible way of showing labor. I had the, the stack of papers back in the days when I did paper grading as an English teacher. And so there is a way to really show this labor that I was doing and I, I could not feel, didn't have to feel guilty about not working hard enough. 
And it's funny you say that, Liz, because I think for me, uh, moving to ungrading decree, like I was probably doing grading wrong. Maybe that's why. <laughs> like grading for me felt like the most difficult labor of all. Ungrading, it's not that ungrading feels like less, but it feels more joyful to me than what I was doing with grading. And I think that gets back at what some other people are saying as well, which is that how you feel about the work or the labor, whichever one, um, colors your um, your perception of this as well. Other thoughts? I do feel like, I put it in the chat, I do feel like grading feedback is an opportunity for me to dialogue with the student. We usually go back and forth on um, Canvas, Moodle, whatever platform we're using so that I can grow too because sometimes they have the most amazing input, the most amazing take on something. And so I, I try, I actually look forward to grading. That's probably not what, uh, I might be a uh, neurodivergent on that, but um, I love it. I, I, I love those, those exercises where, you know, someone just actually said something about alcohol withdrawal that was so profound that I, I asked for permission to share it with the, the class because yeah, you know, it's like getting to the deeper pieces and I think sometimes when it's just between the instructor and the student, they're, they're oftentimes much more willing to take a risk as opposed to in a big group. I think we talked about this, right? Uh, Robin, Martha, and, and um, Matt in our, our trauma workshop that it's great because there's all these different types of educational risks that they're taking. And I just, I love seeing that because then that like, that's where you are going out on the vine for the fruit, right? And uh, it just, it really, it gives me that when I'm feeling down about these other pieces that are really hard, like coming in on Saturdays and Sundays to do different things, right? Where I'm like, oh, now I'm working seven days or laboring seven days, I guess, depending on how we're looking at that. Um, but I have that to look forward to and to say, wow, you know what? I, I learned a lot today looking at what they're, they're sharing with me. So anyway, just for what it's worth. Any other thoughts about assessment grading, labor work? If not, I'm gonna suggest we, we have about 15 minutes left. I knew, we knew we weren't gonna get to all of these questions, but we could jump to the next question, which a few people have already um, put a couple responses to, which is about how, um, and I would even broaden this a little bit and say about how this, uh, because we get to this further down as well, how this conversation about work and labor intersects with um, the question is about mission and values, which usually we think about those in terms of institutional mission and values, but there's also a question further down about sort of like institutional, um, how the institution measures our work and labor, right? Through the various reports and reviews that we have to do on an annual or uh, basis or through p and processes. Um, so as you're thinking about everything we've been talking about so far about what our work feels like, what our work looks like, what, how is that reflected in or, or diametrically opposed to um, what our institution seems to value and ask of us? Any thoughts about that? I think about that a lot as a newer tenure track faculty because for the first time research is included in my job and I don't see any way that the university actually does value that. Um, I think that if I stopped doing that, nobody would really notice. Um, and until, you know, tenure time, and then they'd want to make sure it was on a checklist. But it definitely does not feel like that is something of value. The research piece. Right. Yeah. Even so though I it's think, now you know, explicit. Yeah. Yeah. And it depends so much on your context, because sometimes when I'm talking to people from our ones, they say exactly the same thing about teaching, right? Like there's, you know, my institution doesn't really care what my classes are like, how students are doing, you know, the retention rate is gonna be 99% whatever I do. So they're focused on, you know, pulling in grants and, um, and publishing and making a big name for themselves. But all of this does suggest to me that the mission of the institution does get reflected in our labor practices because you can see different institutions with different, you know, 
institutional values, it comes down to like what you're going to have time to do in your day-to-day -day life. But I think one thing that is hard for some of us now is the, the market for higher ed has created a um, discord between sustaining the university financially and the university's own mission. <laughs> and if the university has to find a way to generate its own revenue, then its stated mission is actually thrown completely out of whack. You almost can't do both at the same time. And so faculty end up laboring to a shadow mission. And I find that responsible. Like I know people say mission statements don't matter or whatever, but I think strategy, vision, mission, all of those things do matter because I think a lot of our wheel spinning comes from the fact that we are not authentically linked to our, to our visions and our missions. We're on this shadow thing. And sometimes I wish, you know, the stated mission of my institution could just be until we are publicly funded, our job is to make money. Um, please try to make some, you know? And then I'd be like, okay, do I wanna work here? Do I not wanna work here? I think I have some ideas for making money, you know? But the, me trying to do this other thing that the university says it wants when really all it needs to stay operational is cash, I think that leads to a lot of, um, disconnect between what you are promised in your career versus what your daily practices look like versus how your reviews are, you know, like what you get kudos for and what you get spanked for and what proposals you make that are killed versus which ones are supported and all that stuff. Other thoughts about the intersection of this with institutional mission values strategy. I'm also thinking about the intersections between different types of jobs, right? So the relationship between faculty, um, contingent faculty uh, versus tenure track faculty versus librarians versus staff, right? And um, I think I think there is an opportunity for solidarity there. I think that often um, we silo ourselves off, right? We kind of heard that in the beginning. I thought that I was above this. I thought that my position was something that didn't have to think about my work in terms of worker rights, in terms of these kind of things. Um, I also think that, you know, there's uh, some folks at the staff level anyway, who, who kind of feel hopeless, like it's almost like the other end of that, where it's like, nobody's going to stand in solidarity with me. This is just the way it is. I'm just going to be a cog in the machine. I'm just going to slug through this, right? So, um, you know, at least I've got my other, I've got my outside life, right? <laughs> I've got my other, you know, my family or the other passions that I have, and they try to kind of keep those things separate from one another. And that's, I think, an emotional response, right? It's a way of protecting your heart. It's a way of protecting your um, motivation, right? It's a way of protecting your soul. I would even go so far as to say, right? Um, but I think there's an opportunity. I think there's an opportunity to look at the, um, the intersections between those different types of work and try to find ways to uh, try to find opportunities where we can be in solidarity with one another. Yeah, Liz. Um, this just occurred to me uh, as well, something that I've been thinking about and other people have been thinking about, I think. When I think about labor of teaching, I w I've been wondering recently about how when I was a student, I had zero awareness, like whoever was in front of the room was a professor and they were all the same to me. I assumed that was a, you know, a job with benefits and a full-time salary. And I'm, I'm so sort of hung up in how some of my labor of teaching might be helping students to see that labor, like not even my labor, but like that there's a difference. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm sort of fraught about it because I think sometimes that difference is 
weaponized <laughs> or can be, but I, I just, I wonder what if students knew, like really sort of in a, and I think some do, but I don't know. I just like, yeah. Okay. Bye. Um, yes, I think that's right. I think if students knew, I think they would be, I, I think if, if, if they really knew, if they kind of realized how this affects them, that it would, it would be huge, right? But it's, that is really hard. It's really hard to uh, educate students about some of these type of measures. Maybe I'm just saying that because I don't really get to work with students as much as I get to work with faculty. So I'm a faculty developer, but like I just, um, was basically offered an opportunity to teach for free. They just wanted me to absorb it into my staff position. And um, they do the same thing to the librarians and the librarians are actually considered to be faculty. Um, and they tell them that if you're gonna teach, you can't you know, get paid for teaching. You have to figure out what you're gonna do to reduce your work in your day job kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I think that there's great opportunities to work with students and talk to students about this kind of stuff, but you got to be able to get in front of students and you got to really educate them about how this stuff is playing out and how it's affecting them. So that's where I struggle. This is, uh, gosh, I, just as you're saying this autumn, it's made, it's reminding me of something that I think came up when we were, uh, this summer, when we were having a conversation in the CoLab, which is the sense that I've had for a long time of the university as being a sort of feudal organization. Feudal, not futile, well, futile maybe, but feudal. Um, and like, and so, and what you've just said and what Liz said, it, to me, it's so much of this is about these hierarchies of, um, of roles and how bad we are at seeing each other across these roles. And I'm talking about the role of student, the role of staff, the different kinds of faculty, and then how bad the institution is at understanding us as whole humans who can occupy multiple roles at once. Um, and it's so, um, you know, I teach as part of my job and I teach, I taught as part of my job at Mary Washington as well. And I actually had to ask for that to become a change at Mary Washington. I had only been able to work as an adjunct where they would pay me above and beyond. And I actually asked and said, no, no, make this part of my job and pay it to me as part of my salary because I was told when I adjuncted, it always had to be work done outside of regular working hours. And I was incapable of thinking of myself as a human who, who, was a, who wore a hat that said staff from eight to five every day. And then after that, I was allowed to think of myself as a teacher. And so all of this to me just sort of like underpins this whole idea of putting people in categories as a way to better understand them, but also as a way to hide them, like hide their experiences within that category and then control them across those categories. Um, and, and it also echoing what um, I think you and Liz said, it reminds me when I used to work as staff at Mary Washington, where I worked so much with both faculty and staff members, and I'd have these conversations with staff who would be like, oh my God, faculty drive me crazy. And then I'd have conversations with faculty who'd say, staff drove me crazy. And then when I actually talked to them, I realized they had no idea what the other person did every day. Like they just had no concept of what the other person's life looked like. And and they're just talking at, across each other and against each other, again, not seeing each other, but not necessarily through a fault of their own, but because of this feudal structure of the institution. Sorry, that was a lot. Um, any yeah, other thoughts? Um, We've got a few minutes left. Yeah, Autumn, go ahead. I was just gonna say that's, that's fascinating to me that that was your take on it as a staff member who's being asked to teach. I guess I see it differently. I also feel like they're, I'm put in a vulnerable position because they actually on paper with HR reduce my staff load. So I would be down to 75%. In a time when the universities are talking about austerity measures, right? I'm, I'm a little afraid that once I'm done teaching that semester, somebody's, it's gonna have to go across somebody's desk right, to bring me back up to 100% in my staff position. And if they're looking for ways to cut, I'm yeah. afraid they'll be like, we've been getting by with 75% of Autumn for a whole semester. <laughs> and meanwhile, <laughs> Autumn's like, this is, are you kidding me? This is 200% of Autumn, you're kidding. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, for uh, sure. yeah, yeah. I, right, um, I, yeah, I would love to have like a, an adjunct title. Um, yeah. 
you know, and make it part of my position, but I guess I, uh, 200% of autumn. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, but, but basically we need to talk to one another. I think we're stronger together. There are opportunities for solidarity across these lines. That's one of the ways that, um, that I think they leverage their power is by keeping us separate and keeping us from talking to one another. So I really appreciate this event. Thank you for inviting the public to it and, uh, allowing us to talk through some of this stuff. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, this has sparked so many thoughts in my head. I hope it's been useful for others. Any other final thoughts or ideas or concerns or questions that anyone wants to take us out on? I'm just catching up on the chat. Yeah, I think there's something Karen said in the chat about faculty and staff working conditions or student learning conditions. Yeah. Is an idea that we can rally around and something that we can bring to students and administration. Yeah. I think that's a great, a great point to leave us on. Um, thank you all so much for, for joining us today. Uh, hopefully we can continue this conversation in other venues on Twitter face-to-face, -face, maybe we can do some kind of follow-up event at some point, because it is clear lots of people care about these, these questions. Have a great rest of your day. Don't work too hard, folks. <laughs> <laughs>